Hi, Chapter 10, All Quiet on the Western Front, Part 2. Right? So we're looking for larger ideas. We're looking for central ideas. Um, the big picture, what the author is trying to tell us about war and humanity. And, uh, and both Paul and his comrade, his soldier friend, have been taken, have been injured and are being taken back home for now to be taken care of. And so Paul has maneuvered a way to, um, to go with his friends so that neither one of them has to be alone. So they've bribed some people with some cigars, etc. Anyway, so we're on page 254 of this book. And, um, and here we go. There are eight men in our room. Peter, a curly black haired fellow, has the worst injury, a severe lung wound. Franz Wachter, alongside him, has a shot in the arm, which didn't look too bad at first, but the third night he calls out to us, telling us to ring. He thinks he has a hemorrhage. I ring loudly. The night sister does not come. We've been making rather heavy demands on her during the night, because we have all been freshly bandaged and so have a good deal of pain. One wants his leg placed so, another so, a third wants water, a fourth wants her to shake his, wants her to shake his pillow. In the end, the buxom old body grumbled bad-temperedly and slammed the doors. Now, no doubt, she thinks it is something of the same sort, and so she is not coming. We wait, then Fran says, ring again. I do so, still she does not put in an appearance. In our wing, there's only one night sister. Perhaps she has something to do in one of the other rooms. Franz, are you quite sure you're bleeding, I ask? Otherwise, we shall be getting cursed again. Hemorrhaging is bleeding. The bandage is wet. Can't anybody make a light? That cannot be done either. The switch is by the door and none of us can stand up. I hold my thumb against the button of the bell till it becomes numb. Perhaps the sister has fallen asleep. They certainly have a great deal to do and are all overworked day after day. And added to that is the everlasting praying. Should we smash a bottle, asked Joseph Hamaker, if of the shooting license? She wouldn't hear that any more than the bell. At last the door opens, the old lady appears, mumbling. When she perceives Franz's trouble, she begins to bustle and says, Why did not someone say I was wanted? We did ring, and none of us here can walk. He has been bleeding badly, and she binds him up. In the morning we look at his face, it has become sharp and yellow, whereas the evening before he looked almost healthy. Now a sister comes oftener. Sometimes there are Red Cross voluntary aid sisters. They are pleasant, but often rather unskilled. They frequently give us pain when remaking our beds and then are so frightened that they hurt us still more. The nuns are more reliable. They know how they must take hold of us, but we, but we would be better pleased if they were somewhat more cheerful. A few of them have, a real, have real spirit. They are superb. There was no one but would do anything for Sister Libertine. Libertine is another symbolic name. It means freedom, liberty. This marvelous sister who spreads good cheer throughout the whole wing, even when she can only be seen in the distance. And there are others like her. We would go through fire for her. A man cannot really complain. Here he is, treated by the nuns exactly like a civilian. And just to think of a garrison hospital gives one the creeps. So he makes a comparison here, a contrast between... Uh, soldier hospitals, which are often mean and, and, and do operations and experiments, and this Catholic Christian hospital where the sisters are nicer and sweeter and, and are a little bit more compassionate, so they would prefer to be in this. Franz Wachter does not regain his strength. One day he is taken away and does not come back. Joseph Hamaker knows all about it. We shan't see him again. They have put him in the dead room. What do you mean, dead room, asks Krop. Well, dying room. What is that, then? A little room at the corner of the building. Whoever is about to kick the bucket is put in there. There are two beds in it. It is generally called the dying room. But what do they do that for? They don't have so much work to do afterwards. It is more convenient, too, because it lies right beside the lift to the mortuary. The mortuary is the place where dead bodies are taken. Uh, like a morgue. Perhaps they do it for the sake of the others also, so that no one in the, war, in the ward dies in sympathy. 
and they can look after him better too, if he is by himself. But what about him? Joseph shrugs his shoulders. Usually he doesn't take much notice anymore. Does everybody know about it then? Anyone who has been here long enough knows, of course. So there's a foreshadowing here of people dying in the dying room, um, a place that's both convenient and private and where people get more care at the end of their lives. In the afternoon, Franz Wachter's bed has a fresh occupant. A couple of days later, they take the new man away too. Joseph makes a significant glance. We see many come and go. That means many die. Often relatives sit by the beds and weep or talk softly and awkwardly. One old woman will not go away, but she cannot stay there the whole night through. The next morning she comes very early, but not early enough. For when she goes up to the bed, someone else is in it already. She has to go to the mortuary. The apples that she has brought with her, she gives to us. So imagine not being able to be with your loved one when they die. Very difficult. And then little Peter begins to get worse. His temperature chart looks bad. And one day the flat trolley roll stands beside his bed. Where to, he asks, to the bandaging ward. He is lifted out, but the sister makes the mistake of removing his tunic from the hook and putting it on the trolley too, so that she should not have to take to make two journeys. Peter understands immediately and tries to roll off the trolley. I'm stopping here. They push him back. He cries out feebly with his shattered lung. I won't go to the dying room, but we're going to the bandaging ward. Then what do you want my tunic for? He can speak no more. Hoarse, agitated, he whispers, stopping here. They do not answer, but wheel him out. At the door, he tries to raise himself up. His black curly head sways. His eyes are full of tears. I will come back again. I will come back again, he cries. The door shuts. We are all excited, but we say nothing. Excited doesn't always mean happy, so that you know. At last, Joseph says, many a man has said that. Once a man is in there, he never comes through. I am operated on and vomit for two days. My bones will not grow together, so the surgeon's secretary says. Another fellows have grown crooked. His are broken again. It is damnable. Among our new arrivals, there are two young soldiers with flat feet. The chief surgeon discovers them on his rounds and is overjoyed. We'll soon put that right, he tells them. We will just do a small operation, then you will have perfectly sound feet. Enter them down, sister. As soon as he has gone, Joseph, who knows everything, warns them. Don't you let him operate on you. That is a special scientific stunt of the old boys. He goes absolutely crazy whenever he can get hold of anyone to do it on. He operates on you for flat feet, and there's no mistake, you don't have them anymore. You have club feet instead and have to walk all the rest of your life on sticks. So the doctors here are sadistic. Sadistic means they enjoy watching other people have pain. And they experiment on people just so that they can get some practice in, as if they're not human beings, um, to see if they can get better at fixing their feet. They practice on soldiers who they know are, you, you know, not useful anyway. <clears throat> What should a man do then? asks one of them. Say no. You are here to be cured of your wound, not your flat feet. Did you have any trouble with them in the field? No. Well, there you are. At present, you can still walk, but if, one, if once the old boy gets you under the knife, you'll be crippled. What he wants is little dogs to experiment with, so the war is a glorious time for him, as it is for all the surgeons. You take a look down below at the staff. There are a dozen fellows hobbling around that he has operated on. A lot of them have been here all the time since 14 and 15. That's 1914 and 1915. Not a single one of them can walk better than he could before. Almost all of them worse, and most only with plaster legs. Every six months he catches them again and breaks their bones afresh, and every time, and every time is going to be the successful one. You take my word. He won't dare to do it if you say no. Ah, man, says one of the two wearily. Better your feet than your brain box. There's no telling what you'll get if you go back out there again. They can do with me just as they please so long as I get back home. Better to have club foot than be dead. The other, a young fellow like ourselves, won't have it done. 
The next morning, the old man has the two hauled up and lectures and jaws at them so long that in the end, they consent. What else could they do? They are mere privates, and he is a big bug. There's a metaphor. They are brought back chloroformed and plastered. That means they have casts on their feet. <clears throat> it is going badly with Albert. They have taken him and amputated his leg. The whole leg has been taken off from the thigh. Now he will hardly speak any more. Once he says he will shoot himself the first time, he can get a hold of his revolver again. A new convoy arrives. Our room gets two blind men. One of them is a very youthful musician. The sisters have a knife with them when they feed him. He has already snatched one from a sister. But in spite of this caution, there is an incident. In the evening, while he is being fed, the sister is called away and leaves the plate with the fork on his table. He gropes for the fork, seizes it, and drives it with all his forth against it, force against his heart. Then he snatches up a shoe and strikes with it against the handle as hard as he can. We call for help, and three men are necessary to take the fork away from him. The blunt prongs had already penetrated deep. He abuses us all night so that no one can go to sleep. In the morning, he has lockjaw. Lockjaw is um, tetanus. When you get, that's why you get tetanus shots. When you, um, when you get tetanus, your jaw locks up and you can't talk. Again, beds are empty. Day after day goes by with pain and fear, groans and death gurgles. Even the death room is no use anymore. It is too small. Fellows die during the night in our room. They go even faster than the sisters can cope with them. But one day the door flies open. The flat tro trolley rolls in, and there on the stretcher, pale, thin, upright, and triumphant, with his shaggy head of curls, sits Peter. Sister Libertine, with beaming looks, pushes him over to his former bed. <clears throat> he is back from the dying room. We have long supposed him dead. He looks round. What do you say now? And Joseph has to admit that it is the first time he has ever known of such a thing. Gradually, a few of us are allowed to get up, and I am given crutches to hobble around on. But I do not make much use of them. I cannot bear Albert's gaze as I move about the room. His eyes always follow me with such a strange look, so I sometimes escape to the corridor. There I can move about more freely. So Paul feels guilty that he can walk, and Albert can't. And... Albert wishes upon wish that he could be Paul. This is what the underlying message is of the author, even though he doesn't come right out and say it. Gradually, gradually a few of us are allowed to get up, and I am, I'm sorry, there we go again. On the next floor below are the abdominable, uh, abdominable. On the next floor below are the abdominal and spine cases, head wounds and double amputations. On the right side of the wing are the jaw wounds, wounds in the joints, wounds in the kidneys, wounds in the testicles, wounds in the intestines. Here, a man realizes for the first time in how many places a man can get hit. Two fellows die of tetanus. Their skin turns pale, their limbs stiffen. At last, only their eyes live, stubbornly. Many of the wounded have their shattered limbs hanging free in the air from a gallows. Gallows are where you... Uh, where people are hung, uh, it's called the gallows. So it's a metaphor. Underneath the wound, a basin is placed into which drip, drips the pus. Every two or three hours, the vessel is emptied. Other men lie in stretched bandages, uh, stretching bandages with heavy weights hanging from the end of the bed. I see intestine wounds that are constantly full of excreta. That means the waste that goes through your body before you poop it out and he can see it moving through their intestines. Pretty graphic, no? The surgeon's clerk shows me x-ray photographs of completely smashed hip bones, knees, and shoulders. A man cannot realize that above such shattered bodies there are still human faces in which life goes its daily round. And this is only one hospital, one single station. There are hundreds of thousands in Germany, hundreds of thousands in France, hundreds of thousands in Russia. Note the repetition, hundreds of thousands. The author's utilizing this to, to make a great impact on how many people are affected, just physically, by war. How senseless is everything, 
that can ever be written, done, or thought when such things are possible. It must be all lies and of no account when the culture of a thousand years could not prevent this stream of blood being poured out, these torture chambers in their hundreds of thousands. A hospital alone shows what war is. I am young. I am 20 years old, yet I know nothing of life but despair, death, fear, and fatuous superficiality cast over an abyss of sorrow. That means things that are not important are a mask over the deep sorrows that people incur. I see how people, how peoples are set against one another. Peoples in the plural there means two large groups of people. And in silence, unknowingly, foolishly, obediently, innocently, slay one another. And that's kind of weird, isn't it, to say it's ironic to say that one innocent, innocently kills somebody else. You know, all to be the pawn of the pol politicians, etc. I see that the keenest brains of the world invent weapons and words to make it yet more refined and enduring. And all men of my age, here and over there, throughout the whole world, see these things. All my generation is experiencing these things with me. That's why, part of the reason they call it the lost generation. Would our fathers do if we suddenly stood up and what would our fathers do if we suddenly stood up and came back before them and proffered our account? What would our fathers who have never seen war like this say if we came home and told them what it really looked like? What would they say to us? Would they still be so nationalistic? Author, what's the author trying to say about that? What do they expect of us if a time ever comes when the war is over? Through the years, our business has been killing. It was our first calling in life. Our knowledge of life is limited to death. What will happen afterwards and what shall come out of us? And some of the poetry we're reading right now relates directly to this. When we read The Second Coming or we read Dulce et de Cormest, or if you ever get the chance on your own to read The Hollow Men, these poems show the degeneration of being going from nationalistic to going to to an entire generation of people knowing how horrible war actually is. The oldest man in our room is Lewandowski. Dowski. He is 40 and he's already lain 10 months in the hospital with a severe abdominal wound. Just in the last few weeks he has improved sufficiently to be able to hobble about doubled up like bent over. For some days past he has been in great excitement. His wife has written to him from the little home in Poland where she lives, telling him that she has saved up enough money to pay for the fare and is coming to see him. She is already on the way and many arrive and may arrive any day. Lewandowski has lost his appetite. He even gives away red cabbage and sausage after he has had a couple of mouthfuls. He goes round the room perpetually with the letter. Everyone has already read it a dozen times. The postmarks have been examined um, heaven knows how often, and the, and the address is hardly legible any longer for spots of grease and thumb marks, and in the end, what is sure to happen, happens. Lewandowski develops a fever and has to go back to bed. He has not seen his wife for two years. In the meantime, he has, she has given birth to a child whom she is bringing with her, but something else occupies Lewandowski's thoughts. He had hoped to get permission to go out with his when his old woman came, for obviously seeing is all very well, but when a man gets his wife again after such a long time, if at all possible, a, ma a man wants something else besides. Lewandowski has discussed it with all of us at great length. In the army, there are no secrets about such things. And what's more, nobody finds anything objectionable in it. Those of us who are already able, able to go out, I'm sorry, those of us who are already able to go out have told him of a, of a couple of very good spots in the town, parks and squares where he would not be disturbed. One of us even knows of a little room. 
But what is the use? There Lewandowski lies in bed with his troubles. Life holds no more joy for him if he has to forego this affair. We console him and promise to get over the difficulty somehow or other. The next afternoon, his wife appears, a tousled li little woman with anxious, quick eyes like a bird. That means the tousled part of it means she has, you know, kind of messy hair, but it's pretty. In a sort of black crinkly mantilla with ribbons. Heaven knows where she inherited the thing. So she's got this Spanish dress on, um, uh, Spanish dress and, and um, um, I think a mantilla is, is like, um, oh gosh, what's it called? Uh, a veil, a long veil with ribbons. She murmurs something softly and stands shyly in the doorway. It terrifies her that there are six of us men present. Well, Marja, says Lewandowski, and gulps dangerously with his Adam's apple. You can come in all right. They won't hurt you. She goes round and proffers each of us her hand. She shakes hands with them. Then she produces the child, which in the intervals has done something in its napkin. From a large handbag embroidered with beads, she takes out a clean one and makes the child fresh and presentable. This dispels her first embarrassment, and the two begin to talk. So I think the napkin that they're talking about is an old-fashioned cloth diaper. And so the baby's pooped, I think. Lewandowski is very fidgety. Every now and then he squints across at us, most unhappily with his round goggle eyes. The time is favorable. The doctor's visit is over. At, at the most, one of the sisters might come in. So one of us goes out to, pros to prospect. He comes back and nods. Not a soul to be seen. Now's your chance, Johan. Set to. The two speak together in an undertone. The woman turns a little red and looks embarrassed. We grin good-naturedly and make poo-pooing gestures. What does it matter? The devil take all conventions. They were made for other times. Here lies the carpenter, Johann Lewandowski, a soldier shot to a cripple, and there is his wife. Who knows when he will see her again? He wants to have her, and he should have her. Good. Two men stand at the door to forestall the sisters and keep them occupied if they chance to come along. They agreed to stand guard for a quarter of an hour or thereabouts. Lewandowski can only lie on his side, no one of us prop, uh, so one of us props a couple of pillows against his side. Albert gets the child to hold. We all turn round a bit. The black mantilla disappears under the bedclothes. We make a great clatter and play scat noisily. All goes well. I hold a club solo with four jacks, which nearly goes the round. In the process, we almost forget Lewandowski. After a while, the child begins to squall, that means cry, although Albert, in desperation, rocks it to and fro. There is a bit of creaking and rustling, and as we look up casually, we see that the child has the bottle in its mouth and is back again with its mother. The business is over. The business they refer to is that, you know, they've had sex in the bed. We now feel ourselves like one big family. The woman is happy, and Lewandowski lies there sweating and beaming. Beaming means smiling, big. He unpacks the embroidered handbag, and some good sausages come to light. Lewandowski takes up the knife with a flourish and saws the meat into slices. With a handsome gesture, he waves towards us, and the little woman goes from one to another and smiles at us and hands round the sausage. She now looks quite handsome. We call her mother. She is pleased and shakes up our pillows for us. So again, you know, she becomes somebody who is a caretaker in, in many different kinds of ways, the woman. And they call her mother, which is also a reference to the Holy Mother in Christianity, who helped her children and her son and all the other people in, uh, by doing good works. After a few weeks, I have, I have to go each morning to, to the massage department. There my leg is harnessed up and made to move. The arm has healed long since. New convoys arrive from the line. The bandages are no longer made of cloth, but of white cray paper. Rag bandages have become scarce at the front. Albert's stump heals well. The wound is almost closed. In a few weeks, he should go off to an institute for artificial limbs. He continues not to talk much and is much more solemn than formerly. Solemn means serious. He often breaks off in his speech and stares in front of him. If he were not here with us, he would have shot himself long ago. But now he is over the worst of it, and he often looks on while we play scat.
I get convalescent leave. That means he can go home to rest and, and, and get better. My mother does not want to let my mother does not want to let me go away. She is feeble. It is all much worse than it was last time. Then I am recalled to my regiment and return once more to the line. Parting from my friend Albert Krop was very hard, but a man gets used to that sort of thing in the army. So at the end of chapter 10, we <clears throat> slowly mark throughout the course of the, this thing, Paul's injury, his fear, his existential questions, why is he alive? What is his purpose? What are the things that are left in life? We see little glimpses of what love means, what humanity is, what a friend will do for a friend. We see the irony in many things, especially the doctors who want to experiment on people who are already suffering. We've seen contrast and we've seen larger ideas through the author, through Paul's point of view and what he observes. We, we hear what the author is trying to tell us about human beings, the good and the bad, about war, about humanity, what people will do for each other. So as we move on to chapter 11, again, keep these larger ideas in mind. And, um, and pretty soon we'll be finishing up this book. All right, chapter 11, next. <laughs>